Hey everyone, good morning to you, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which time you're seeing this. I'm excited, we just started critical thinking. <laughs> you have done the first five or so units, and I suppose you have had a good time, relatively, getting yourself acquainted with uh, language, its use, errors that are committed, and how you can correct them. You have also seen several ways of uh, engaging language, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly. We have seen how some factual statements may also be value judgments or even definitions, and how a critical mind would want to access and assess information coming to them, and more importantly, also how they present information to others. You've seen equivocation, ambiguity, <laughs> Excuse me, you've seen different uses, say, of the word law and how that can play in some of the debates we have in society. You have seen definitions and the types, the different connotations of the word and how the connotation determines the denotation. Those were all quite interesting. Now we enter into the second part of our course in critical thinking, and it will focus now a bit more on the reasoning, not just on the, the, the language proper. There's, there are still some overlaps, but you would see that the focus now is mainly on the reasoning. So in unit six, I'm going to look at deduction versus induction. And our, our focus as always is to make sure that we are learning to pass our exams, yes, but more importantly, to make the impact that is necessary. In this unit, it's quite dense, but not impossible at all if you, you study this strategically with a lot of experience. Okay, so we will, we will try to bring what we, we know to bear, but you would also make an effort at a bit engaging the content a bit more intensely than you would have done in the previous sessions. We want to make sure that in this unit, you know um, um, particular general statement. You can tell what the reference class and attribute class of the statement is. Now the types of generalizations, the universal as well as the uh, uh, disguised conditionals. All these will be real to you as we move on, then major, major, major distinction, we want you to know between deductive argument and inductive argument. Now, then we will delve into the four valid syllogistic patterns. You would want you to understand syllogisms, understand negation. You know, I could even quickly say here that the negation of a negation becomes positive. Remember, nege, nege, po kind of thing that is so two negatives generate a positive. All that will be crucial for your understanding of deductions. Okay, then we'll look at the four deductive patterns and then some fallacies that pretend to be like them. And then now we'll establish the fact that valid arguments may not necessarily be sound. So let's start, let's start. I mean, deduction versus induction. These are two ways of arguing. They are labels given to two distinct ways of reasoning. The reasoning patterns in actual life may overlap, but we still have the extremes when we say a certain argument or reasoning pattern is a deductive one versus when we would consider that reasoning inductive. So let's put some flesh to it. When we reason or we argue deductively, it means that if the premises were true, then the conclusion we are drawing must also necessarily be true. This is a conditional claim. You see, if, if it's a conditional uh, term, if the premises were true, the premises you're referring to the reasons, evidence you're offering to support the claim you are making. That's what an argument really is. So if the premises you are offering were true, and it will therefore require necessarily, keep, take note, 
that the conclusion also be true, then we will say that that kind of argument or reasoning was a deductive one. It would just mean you deduced that conclusion you are drawing directly from the given premises. You didn't go out of the premises to come to that conclusion. However, in certain contexts, when you argue, the premises you are giving may be offering support for the conclusion, but it is not a necessary support. In other words, it is possible for us to accept the premises you offered to be true. So yes, what you say is true in terms of the premises, yet the conclusion you are drawing need not necessarily follow. In other words, it could be false, the conclusion you draw, even where the premises are true, then we'll say that kind of reasoning was an inductive one, inductive reasoning. Okay, so sometimes we argue deductively, sometimes we argue inductively. For the deductive one, there is a necessary uh, relation between the given premises, truth, and the conclusion drawn, truth. That's, that's a necessary one. It means it couldn't have been other than that conclusion you have drawn if the premises were true. That is deduction. But for induction, it is possible for the premises to be true yet conclusion falls and no contract, uh, contradiction is created, then that suggests that it was merely, or if you like, simply an inductive reasoning. And so you couldn't do a deduction of that conclusion. Now on the screen now we recall what an argument is, just to help you put things in perspective. That argument is a single, con uh, a single conclusion drawn on the basis of evidence given, okay? So when you have an argument, it is distinct from a statement. Statements come together to form an argument, okay? So not one statement, it is a statement, one single statement like this that can be true or false. But when you put statements together in a, connect, in a certain way to make a, a case on the basis of evidence, then we have an argument, okay? So an argument cannot be true or false. That's the point I want to make. I've seen quite a few of such questions come to me by my channel. So I am trying to clarify that. You don't say that argument is true or that argument is false. You can label argument as being true or false. It's statements that can be true or false. However, arguments are constituted by a statement. You put statements together to create an argument. And in that argument, there will be only one conclusion. So the conclusion is what you actually want to say, and the premises or evidence or reasons would be what? What you present as justification for what you are saying. And down there, you see some conclusion indicators and premise indicators you should imbibe that. If you have an argument, then these will be useful to you. Where there is an argument that does, hence, therefore, so, et cetera, establish what or indicate conclusion. They show you what a conclusion statement is. Pass, sense, if given that provided, et cetera. Words like that pro provide what the evidence, the reasons, technically called what the premises supporting the claim you are making. It isn't the case that anytime you see these indicator words, it just, that's enough. That is enough to show you that you have an argument. No, you shouldn't do that. Because you could have a sense that is not indicating reasons. It's only establishing time frame, you know. So you must first have an argument that is an inferential relationship. There is an attempt to convince you to accept a certain claim on the basis of evidence. When you have that, then now you can use these indicator ways to determine which part of that passage is the conclusion and which part is the premises. Okay, so let's compare these two uh, arguments on the screen. You would see that there are three steps, two premises leading to a conclusion. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching alongside, you know, projecting stuff on the screen for you. So some of them you would have to be seeing alongside. Okay, I'm currently highlighting something on the screen. So here, this is. The first one is labeled deductive argument. The second one, inductive argument. Why would we call the first one deductive? You say all students write exams. Amma is a student. So 
she writes exams. It's clear to us that the so she writes exam is the conclusion. And that is the only thing the person really wants to say. How do we know that so she writes exam? So the conclusion is what I actually want to say. The premises, the other statements, give me reasons why I'm saying what I'm saying. So they become the premises or the reasons or evidence supporting the conclusion she writes exam. Now we want to check whether this is deductive or inductive. Simply means we want to check if there is a necessary relationship between what the premises and the conclusion. That is to say, we want to check whether if these premises were true, would it necessarily lead us to this conclusion? I keep stressing necessarily. Is this by force, this conclusion going to follow by force after this premises? That is the question. If it is an optional following, then it is not a necessary conclusion, you see. But if it must follow it, then it becomes necessary and therefore deductive. So let's check and see. You see how the shadow of a human person follows that human being wherever they go? So if the premises were the human being, the conclusion will be the conclusion. Think of deduction that way, a valid deduction that way, and it might help. Okay. So the premises, the human being herself. The conclusion, her shadow. The conclusion is already part of the premises for a valid deductive argument. So if the human person moves, a shadow moves with her. I also use the pregnant woman scenario. If the premises represent the pregnant woman and the conclusion will then be what? The baby and her tummy. If you call the premises into your room, you invariably call in the baby alongside. So you cannot ask the preg pregnant mother into your room and when she comes in and the baby is in the tummy and they come to sit on your couch, you say, why did you bring the baby in? I don't want the baby in my room. Get the baby out. Well, if she will get the baby out, it will mean she will have to be gone along with the baby. So there's a necessary connection between premises and conclusion for deduction, if valid. Therefore what? Therefore, look at the relationship here. Would you call this argument deductive? Yes. If all students write exams and Amma is a student, then Amma, like all students, will also write exams. So if you accepted my two premises to be true, it might not be true. So we are not looking at whether it is actually true or actually false, whether all students write exams. Not at all. See the second one, most Ghanaians are hospitable. We are not interrogating the actual truth or actual falsity of this statement. No, our concern is if we granted that these premises were true, would it necessarily require that we, have, we accept this conclusion as true also? That's what we are looking at. So if you were making note, your notes, I would prompt you here, write it down that the validity or otherwise of an argument is not concerned with the actual truth or falsity of it, actual. We are looking at the logical truth of it. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, all students write exams. Amma is a student, so she writes exams. If I accepted that all students write exams and Amma is a student, I don't need to even say it. It would then mean, obviously, that I have accepted that Amma writes exams. So this is a deduction meaning the conclusion necessarily followed from the premises. The contrast is the case in the second scenario where I say most Ghanaians are hospitable. My mother is a Ghanaian. Therefore, I want to conclude that she's hospitable. Now you would see that this conclusion that she's hospitable need not necessarily follow even if we granted the two premises here to be true. Why? Because my mother may be part of the few left. When I say most, I haven't said all. So my mother may be part of the few who for some legitimate reason or illegitimate reason have ceased to be hospitable or would not consider being hospitable at all. So what? So this conclusion, she's hospitable, is not a necessary one. It may be probable. And in this instance, if we say most, then the conclusion we are drawing is likely 
to be what? Probable. But probability, like we learned, if you recall in your call mark, probability is never equal to one. Never 100%. So this may be a good confirmation of the claim that she is hospitable. You know, my mother is hospitable. How do we say that? Because if we say most, it means that perhaps our research has shown us that quite a number would be hospitable. But that is only a confirmation, not a proof. So you see in your unit six, there's also that statement there, the confirmation is not a proof. In deduction up here, we can say this is a proof. Proof means it couldn't have been otherwise. It's a valid deduction. The conclusion couldn't have been different if we granted the premises to be true. So that is a proof. But a confirmation only means it might be highly probable, but it is never, take note, a certainty. Okay, so when you are dealing with inductive reasoning, when you are reasoning inductively, which often happens in our research, as sampling, political science, data gathering, you know, sociological issues, we are trying to analyze, we will oftentimes at that level, mostly, not all the time, be doing induction, high induction. You want to be careful how you project your hypothetical claims as though they were certainties. They, they are not. You may need to be wary of that. So what you do take from this slide, deduction is not the same as induction. Both are dealing with how you ground your conclusions, you know, on the basis of evidence. Whereas one has a necessary connection between its premises and conclusion, such that if the premises were true, it would require that the conclusion be true. That's for deduction. The other would have a more relaxed posturing between premises and conclusion. Even if the premises were granted to be true, there isn't a necessary you know, uh, conclusion. The, the, the truth of the conclusion will not be a necessary one. That is what we have called inductive reasoning. Now you see that the rest of the content in unit six focuses on deduction because your unit seven will, will engage inductive reasoning in, in the sciences and everyday life. And then we will skip unit eight, which will not be substantive for your exam, we will not use it. But unit eight gives you a, an example of inductive reasoning type. That is what argument based on sampling, where you sample out and then you draw your conclusions based on what you have sampled and how much affinity the sample has with the pool and et cetera, et cetera. But for the purposes of your examination, you wouldn't need the unit eight, at least as I see it on the course. Uh, syllabus communicated to the teaching team. Now, but you will then move on to unit nine, which deals with another type of what? Induction, causal reasoning, cause and effect reasoning, uh, how we establish the causes of things and then whether there are fallacies that we are committing or not in the way we are reasoning causally. You went to a party with a friend, you come home, you all had the same combination of dishes, but it turns out that you are running and she's not. Or you ate everything with the exception of one or two things, but you are fit and she's not. How do we examine, analyze, you know, you know, attribute the possible causes of things? What is that? What is the possible cause of COVID-19? We will engage those. So those are all inductive argument types. You also see yes, Mills's for uh, methods of cause. I'm saying this so that those who are able to read ahead can read them down. They are all a bit more accessible to them, not too technical. Okay. Then unit 10 will engage fallacies associated with that. So the rest of unit six, I just wanted you to know, we'll focus more on deduction, the types, uh, the fallacies associated with that in practical instances. You should be able to, you know, uh, give me a valid conclusion if I, I give you the premises, because we have already established that if it is a deduction and a valid one, given the premises, the human person, you can immediately deduce the conclusion, the shadow, etc., cetera, et cetera, okay? So you take note of that. Where you, I, I hide one premise, I give you one, I hide the other and ask you for the conclusion. Let me say it now, here and now, because I know people may not look at it 
so they have been asked to answer, you know, where you have one premise, a hidden premise, and then a conclusion. It means I don't give you the two premises for you to conclude. I give you just one premise, hide the other one, and give you the conclusion. Then I ask you to magically tell me what the hidden premise is. It's called an enkemim, that kind of uh, 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 argument where there is a hidden premise. I give, I give you the first one, then I give you the conclusion and ask you to give me the hidden premise. It's called an enkemim. Okay, and then you see that in your textbook. So take note of that. All right. So on the screen now we have two types of arguments and examples. I'm sure by now you would have seen why uh, example three on your screen is inductive, whilst uh, example four is deductive. So you see the premise here is since the security man was the last person who left the building yesterday, as the reason I'm offering to conclude therefore that he stole the project leader's laptop. Now, if we, we even granted that it is true that the security man was the last person who left the building yesterday, even if we accepted that to be true, that it doesn't necessarily mean that he stole the project leader's laptop. And in our discussion earlier uh, in the morning, I, I, I told you some even steal their own laptop people, they steal it and hide it because they know that there will be issues if we don't get it for him. So people in the office or who share the dormitory may say, look, let's contribute and pay for it so that there will be peace. Meanwhile, the person stole his own laptop, needs some money, people. So the fact that someone was the last person left the room does not even mean that he stole something, necessarily speaking. He may be the one, he may not be. All right, so this is inductive argument. It means for such a reasoning, we need better if you like, and further particulars. We cannot look at the argument itself to draw any conclusions. We would have to investigate further. That's the rationale. But for deductive argument, and the example on the screen now that I'm pointing to, all mangoes are fruit, my pen is not a fruit. It has to follow that it is not a mango. Take note. I'm not dealing with whether pens are actually fruit or not. You see in a jiffy, that it's not really about the actual actuality of the uh, terms we are using that, oh, but dog bear, pens are not fruits and mangoes. So obviously, not, that is not what is in contention. We are looking at the pattern of reasoning. See, all mangoes are fruits. My pen is not a fruit. I'm telling you that all mangoes are fruits. That's the first premise, everything I've given you. Then I tell you, my pen is not even a fruit. Take note that if I say all mangoes are fruit, I mean all mangoes, the set of mangoes, are inside the bigger set of what? Fruits. So mangoes themselves are inside the big set called what? Fruits. Now, if I go further to tell you that my pen is not a fruit, it means my pen is not even in the very big set, which is the mother set. My pen is not in the mother set fruit. How can that pen then be in the baby set inside the mother set? How can the pen be part of mango? It can't. So this conclusion that, so the pen is not a mango, necessarily follows from the given premises. This is a deduction. If I accepted the first two as true, I am obliged necessarily to accept the conclusion that follows. That is what makes it a deduction. And in fact, that was, a valid deduction, another form different from what I showed you earlier. What I showed you uh, previously, this one, this deduction is called modus tollens, where I deny the consequent and then it leads to a denial of the antecedent. So you see, I've used the term consequent and antecedent. I presuppose that after our discussions, you would have engaged it so it's a bit more clearer to you. Mangoes. All mangoes are fruit. If mango, then fruit. That's what it means. So universals are actually what conditionals. We don't need to do a whole lecture on that. So listen to the video. So some of the things I, I, I put in to enrich the discussion will help you. We don't have to do another lecture discussion to show you that conditional statements are in a scheme. Universal statements are conditional. You don't need to do, I have to do a lecture to tell you that when the premises are true, 
and the argument is itself already valid, then it means it is sound. This is clearly written in the text. So you have to read it. I can touch on it as we discuss, but I, I believe that the lectures are meant to help you understand the substance that may not be that explicit in the text. So you have to do your bit of the reading and engage the lecture video, like I have said to the class previously. Okay, so all mangoes are fruits. My pen is not a fruit. All mangoes are fruits just means if mango, then fruits. Now that clearly shows itself was as a conditional. And so we are able to know the antecedent, the if clause. If mango, then fruits. So if antecedent, then consequent. Okay. My pen is not a fruit. So I just said, my pen is not a fruit. That is a denial, not, of what they're giving consequent. As soon as I negate or deny the consequent, and I conclude by also denying or negating the antecedent, it will be valid. So all mangoes are fruit. My pen is not even a fruit. Then it couldn't be a mango. This is called modus tollens, which was also labeled as what? Negating the consequent or denying the consequent in the introduction slide. Okay. Now, that is why this is valid. See the earlier one that I put on the screen. Another deed action here. See, all students write exams. Ama is a student. Here, after antecedent, see, all students write exams. If student, then write exams. Which one is the antecedent? Student. Which one is the consequent? Write exam. So after this, my conditional statement, what did I do next? I affirmed the antecedent. I said, Amma is a student. See the pattern. The other one, I denied the consequent. Next, before concluding. Here, after my universal or the conditional statement, what did I do? I affirmed the antecedent. Amma is a student. So she writes exam. So this is also valid, but this is not modus tollens. This one is what? Modus ponens. Ponens, I call it modus Paul. And the other one is modus timuti. And it's simple. It's just the pattern, not the content. That should tell you that I could have said, all tables are chairs. Keep looking on the screen. Yeah, we have all student rights exams. I could have said all tables are chairs. My lecture is a table. <laughs> it has to follow. Oh, yes, it has. That then she is a chair. And you and I know that I'm not a table, neither am I a chair. I don't think any of your lectures are. Even not all your lectures are she's. So it is not the actual content you are dealing with, like I told you earlier. It's the pattern. That's why we can use variables to do deduction. And we will be able to deduce easily because with, regardless of the particular content put there, the form, if it follows, will be valid. So all A's are B's. This thing is an A. It has to follow that it is what? A B modus ponens. The one that I showed you earlier, uh, later, this one, all A's are B's. I'm dealing with your example for now. Just in case my, any of my special student is listening in, okay. All uh, A's are B's. This thing is not a B. Then it follows that it is not an A. This is also valid. Modus tollen. So we went ahead of ourselves two steps and we are coming back. Why? Because of our engagement earlier today. It helps you to get the clarity. You see that in both instances, we are deducing our conclusion from the given premises. And since our examples are valid ones, we are even able to label the kind of deduction we have there. So you can never label your inductive argument, the I ones as what well, valid, they can't be valid. Okay, we'll deal with that one, we'll get to unit seven. Validity is a label we attach to what? Deduction. So we say we have a valid deduction. An induction is already invalid. Okay? 
All right. Why is it already invalid? It is invalid because its conclusion doesn't follow its premises necessarily. But deductive argument could be valid if you, you set it in a way that the conclusion necessarily follows its premises. If you don't do it right, I'm talking about deduction now, then it will be an invalid deduction, like the fallacies that you saw in the introduction, trying to do modus ponens, but you, you do not arrange it to follow the pattern, then that will be invalid. So it is a deduction, all right, but it will be a, an invalid deduction. That's why when you affirm, I've discussed with you, so I touch on it now for clarity, okay? That's why when you affirm the consequent, instead of affirming the antecedent, we would say you have committed the fallacy, it's a formal fallacy, it's a deductive fallacy, okay? We say you have committed the fallacy of what? Affirming the consequence. You don't affirm consequence, okay, like we discussed earlier. All right. So a deductive argument could be valid or invalid. But as for an inductive argument, it can never be valid. It is necessarily already invalid. That was an important point to help clarify things for some of you. All right. So on the screen now, those who are reading have already seen that we can now give a, a simple, straightforward de definition of deductive arguments. An argument whose truth, you know, whose premises is truth guarantees what the truth of the conclusion. Take note. That is simply saying is an argument whose premises, if true, will guarantee, so I highlight stuff for you to see the emphasis, will guarantee what the truth of the conclusion. If the premises are true, that is when it will guarantee the truth of the word conclusion. I've told you that the premises is the mother, the pregnant mother. The conclusion, the baby inside her. So if the mother is well, then we, we suppose that she can sustain and push a strong baby out. Think of it that way for easy understanding. You should not turn the relationship upside down. So you should look out for that. We could possibly ask you to tell us whether this is true or false. And then what would I would have said there will be the truth of the conclusion guarantees the truth of the con uh, of the premises. Then people would say, oh, true, oh, yeah, we saw premises and conclusion and guarantee too. But that, is, that cannot, it's not the baby, the conclusion that guarantees the premises, the mother. No, it is the other way around. So premises, if true, guarantee or proves the truth of the conclusion. Whilst uh, the same thing is said in the second point, but differently. In a deductive argument, if the premises are assumed to be true, then the conclusion is what? Necessarily true. This is where the thing is, that's the gist, necessarily true, I've said that. Then in a valid, take note, deductive argument, it is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time, okay? Now that means, if you didn't have a valid deduction, then this third point won't hold. So here, the emphasis is where you have a valid deduction, you have deduced correctly, not you have committed a formal fallacy in your deduction. That one, this law will not hold, okay? So when you deduce validly, that is when you deduce such that the conclusion will follow the premises wherever it goes because of how you spoke. If we accepted the premises to be true, the conclusion will follow necessarily. If you deduced that way, then it is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion falls at the same time. That will create a contradiction. Contradiction, contra, opposite, diction, language, okay? So you will create an opposite language, like the bachelor saying he has beaten his own wife. Whoosh, you know, that is problematic language. So we won't be able to even speak coherently any longer. We'll be upset to engage us if we accepted our premises to be true and yet the necessary conclusion that follows it. You don't want to. Then we'll say we are speaking absurdity. I need us to understand this. That's why I have stressed 
on this over and over and over again. Because if you get this, then the rest of the content will fall into place. You are just pushing them into the appropriate place in your thoughts. But if you don't, then it means you'll be struggling to get the distinction. Why is it that this is inductive? Why is this not deductive? Then modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism, and the others will not make meaning when we start building on it. Then you wouldn't even see why we would call, call some other part of it a fallacy and all that, okay? So I am spending some good time here to help you for clarity, and you should engage it and engage it and engage it, hopefully. When you get the main strands and the distinction between one and the other, then when you are adding or topping up, I think it will be a bit more accessible to you. All right. So some valid deductive argument forms. I have already mentioned them as we engage the other one. Before we move on to that, though, let me say this quickly. You have seen that also in your text. You cannot do any other kind of distinction between deduction and induction than what we have given you, see? When you do that, like some people have done in some readings, distinguishing deduction from induction by saying that, oh, deductive arguments move from general premises to uh, particular conclusions. So the, the premises are general for a deductive argument while their conclusions are particular. And then they say, oh, as for induction, they, they, they move from particular premises toward general conclusion. That may be true to an extent, but it is not true for all cases. We could have a deduction uh, that has all particular statements. All the statements are particular premises and conclusion alike. So you want to be careful, friends, not to think of the contrast between deduction and induction in terms of what? General versus particular. That won't help you. When we engage general statement and particular statement, you see the point I make, okay? What I'm saying to you is, if I say the distinction between a man and a woman is that women have long hair and men have short hair, how did it, that, how that, will that help you to truly and actually distinguish men from women, how? That doesn't help you at all because we have women that keep their hair short. We have men that keep their hair long. So it may be so for some cases, but not for all cases. That is why I put here such a, a, a demarcation or a contrast between deduction and induction is what? Ambiguous. It's not clear when I say one moves from general to particular. If I said Kofi is taller than Kwame and Kwame is taller than Ajwa, won't it follow therefore that Kofi is taller than Ajwa? It won't necessarily. You can't accept it to be true that Kofi is taller than Kwame and Kwame is taller than Ajwa, but you don't want to accept the conclusion therefore that Kofi is taller than Ajwa. No matter how much you like or hate any of them, this is necessarily true, the conclusion we draw, given that the premises were true. Now, what is the point? The point is all three statements I have given you that Kofi is taller than Kwame, that's one. Second one, and Kwame is taller than Ajwa. That's the second premise. And I'm concluding, therefore, that Kofi is taller than Ajwa. These three statements together do not contain any general statement. Yet, it is a deduction. So if someone told you that deductive arguments move from general premises to particular conclusion, then they wouldn't have considered what I have just given you, an instance of what? A deduction. But it is a deduction. Okay, there are other examples in your text where we could have general state, state, uh, statements leading to particular conclusions, and yet the conclusion drawn is not a deduction. It is an induction. For example, if I said 90% of lecturers are rich, Dr. Miles is a lecturer, so she is rich. The 90% of lecturers are rich is a generalization. If you engage the content, you see it's a statistical generalization, not a universal generalization, do, but it is still a generalization. So I have now introduced statistical versus uh, universal, or if you like law-like generalization. Your, your task 
will be to read around that. It is part of these slides, but I wouldn't want a very lengthy presentation per content. Even though we are dealing with the same unit six, I want to cut them into chunks in a way that is accessible to you. So as I mentioned, universal generalization is a statistical generalization. A good student will now engage their textbook or the slides, which is complete at Sakai now, what I'm working with now to develop the video for you. I've already presented to you. Go ahead and read what makes a statement a generalization. What makes it a particular statement? Then where we have generalizations, how do we determine the one that is universal or law-like generalization? And how do we distinguish that from the one that is what particular? Uh, did I say particular? The one that is statistical generalization. You know. So when you do that, you help yourself. And then when we meet for our interactive sessions, the second time this week, for those who have two groups with me, I still have four sessions to go and I've opened the links to all my groups and even students that may want to be part of it for the other groups, you are welcome. You can then bring questions. That is how you do this, so that you will progress. Because you are going to write an exam, okay? I'm saying that you could have an argument that moves from a generalization to a particular statement. And yet, that is not considered a deduction, like the example I just gave you, okay? So if 90% of politicians are rich, and Ejaya is a politician, and I conclude therefore that he's rich. I have moved from a general premise to a particular conclusion, but we all know, at least from our earlier example, that that is not a deduction because Ejaya could be part of the 10% politicians left, which were not included in our 90% categorization, okay? So what? So the correct way to distinguish deduction from induction is what we gave you earlier in this presentation. For a deduction, if the premises are true, it would require that the conclusion must also be true. Otherwise, you will create a contradiction. That is it. For induction, it is possible for the premises to be true, conclusion false, and yet no contradiction created. This is the litmus test for determining induction and contrasting it from what deduction. Excellent. Now we have already seen from some of the examples I have given that deduction is topic neutral. It means a deductive argument is neutral to the topic being discussed. It doesn't focus on what the specific content is or the subject matter is. So I could say all chichis are chaches. This thing is a chichi. It has to follow, therefore, it is a cha cha. And we don't know what chichi and cha cha represent. Okay? Because we are just interested in what? The pattern. See, the pattern of thought, the structure of thought, the form of thought, not necessarily the content of thought. But induction thinks otherwise. Inductive argument will engage the subject matter itself. Did you say most? Did you say few? What was, what was being discussed? You know, so. In induction, it seems, is a little bit more difficult because you are dealing with actuality than with um, deduction, where it is purely form. I can sit on, in my office as an armchair scholar and deduce that you said this. If what you said is granted to be true, then this cannot con 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 necessarily follow. And this has to follow. Or this kind of, so deduction is just dealing with what? forms or pattern. That's why I can say all lectures, excuse me, all beds. I want to give you a very absurd one and yet valid. So let's say all tables fly. My lecture is a table. <laughs> you know, it will follow that she flies by modus ponens. You see that. So validity is not necessarily what truth. Now, I will just mention the types of valid deductive argument, and then I'll do another presentation still connected to this. This one helps you see deduction versus induction and throw some light on some very you know, pertinent things that you need clarity on. The next one I'll do for you still in the course of the day would focus now on the valid patterns themselves. And I do them alongside the fallacies that pretend to be like the, the former fallacies so that you can see the difference. And then we will now touch on uh, general versus particular and those other 
details that will be relevant also for Unit 7. Okay, so now the four types of valid deductive syllogistic arguments are what? Why are we doing the, the how are we labeling them syllogistics? They are syllogisms. Look down here. I say a syllogism is a form of deductive argument with what? Two premises and one conclusion. They actually should be connected in a certain way. But for your purposes as, as critical thinkers at level 100, we can do all the other you know, ingredients that make an argument a syllogism. The key thing you need for your purposes is what? A syllogism has what? two premises and one conclusion. It is first of all a deductive argument related in a certain way. But what should you look out for? There are two premises leading to one conclusion. So you would have seen already the examples I have been giving you for deductive arguments were all syllogistic arguments. Now I want you to know here and now that modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, hypothetical syllogism are all what? Syllogisms. As for disjunctive syllogism and hypothetical syllogism, they already come with the name syllogism. So it's, it's easier to know them as what syllogisms, but modus ponens and modus students may suggest to you that they are not syllogisms. They are all syllogisms, okay? They just didn't take their father's name, that's all. <laughs> but they are their father's daughter and son. All right, so I called modus ponens affirming the antecedent and I called modus students denying or negating the consequent. And at this stage, if you are getting yourself overwhelmed, when will I learn all these things? Don't you get yourself worked up? Just ask yourself, these plenty names, these complex names, they are not as complex as my surname <laughs> or yours. Just convince yourself that I, I will weather the storm also, and you will do very fine, okay? So you, you will see that in my next presentation, I'll start talking about uh, the four valid forms. I don't want to top up with this, so that when you select this video, your focus will be to know what the difference between deduction and induction and then some teasers on valid deductions. And you will get that and make sure you have mastered that. Then you take the next uh, presentation still on the, on the units and the slides given to you. You still do not know if there are content on this for you, go to Sakai. I have, I have posted uh, the whole slides to the end for unit six, as I have put them together for you. I posted it there. This is just a part of the presentation on that to help you. I will do another part. I think I can segment them into three or four for easy understanding and focus of the units. Have a wonderful day till you hear from me again. You should subscribe to the channel. It helps you. When I upload, you will get a prompt. You go to the videos and then locate the playlist. The playlist makes it easier for you. You don't have to wander all over the sites through my videos to get what you are looking for. You go to UGRC 150 and then keep the focus now on your unit six, seven, nine, and 10. Why? Why? Because units one, two, three, and five will only cover up to what you have done so far, your mid -sem. You can't be studying unit one now. Quickly complete the multiple choice questions we've set for you on the mid -sem and the quizzes one and two. I think I would extend them again for the whole period for those who may, may not have been able to do it. And as I extend it to me, will not be getting feedback from me until level one is done. But we'll see about that. Just make sure you are not stressing yourself over what we have already covered, which would only uh, you know, be, be what we were examining you on for the what? For the mid -sem exam proper which takes your other 50 percent will be on unit six seven nine and ten so you, by now you should be engaging those those content read ahead those that are easily accessed just be reading ahead and putting down okay because this is the fourth week and we'll have the fifth and the sixth and then we are done so you should spread your tentacles wider than keeping all your eggs in just one basket i think that a way to the wise is enough Thank you. Look out for the next video. Have a wonderful, pleasant day. God bless you.